Hey, how you doing? Recently, I just finished up a review on the new Mazda 3, and there was so much technical detail in that video that I had brain damage afterwards. Now, believe it or not, I was a little bit disappointed in myself for having to cut away some of the things I wanted to include, like all of the pros and cons of that car. And I've spoken with Mazda directly, I talked to people that have test driven it, other members of the automotive press, and what I'm going to give you is the best of the Mazda 3 and the worst, so you can take away some subjective and objective elements. Let's get started. The exterior of the Mazda 3, you have two body styles, a hatch and a sedan. And it doesn't matter what car you pick or choose, whether it's a McLaren, a Ferrari, a Honda Civic, usually people are divided into two camps. One side will tell you the car is so disgusting that they want to throw up in their mouth. And then the other side is the type that will go in their garage in the middle of the night and hump it and rub it with a diaper. And that's the way exterior styling is. It's totally subjective, it's personal. With this Mazda 3, it's just an evolution of the last car. There's more attention to detail, like on the hatch, you have the black grille, the darker wheels, and on darker colors, it looks more cohesive. But you know what, that's my opinion. There are details they've added, like this olive green type black in the front grille and matte textures to break up a lot of the elements. And it's one of these things, you go to a dealership in decent light or in a garage and you look at it and you decide whether you can live with it or not. But instead of wasting my time on that, let's get on the inside. All right, let's start with the pros. And in the interior, it's a great place to start. The biggest thing about the new Mazda 3 and this next generation from Mazda is their attention to detail on the interior space. The stitching, the dash design, the leather, the way that they've integrated the screen and the dash now, it looks more like it's a part of it instead of being an afterthought. They have padded the armrests, the center armrest, the door armrest feels ex far more cushy than it used to be. Your knee area is padded on the right hand side. The knobs, buttons and switches are some of the best in the segment and you have to go into the luxury car area to have this type of tactile feedback and pretty much every knob, button and switch in here. And you notice this when you're driving and interacting with the car. The shifter is manual where you have physical clicks between all your gears. It's not digital. Your infotainment command knob is easy to use. It has a solid click. There's no vagueness in it. The way that the buttons are laid out is intuitive to the point when you're using it and driving it, you don't have to look at it when you remember where everything is at. There is so much here in terms of just thought to lay out and design to make you feel integrated with the car. And that's one of the best changes that Mazda has made with this generation. The next thing you'll appreciate is the color options. You have this black interior, you have this gray or darker gray that I'm sitting in now, and you have the red option, which gives it a little bit of character depending on who you are. Yeah, a black interior is gonna pretty, pretty much be the most long lasting. You're not going to have any color shift or, you know, you're not going to see all the dirt like you would in a lighter color interior, but you might like this option and it's a cool thing. You have the option of a wireless charging pad that is in your armrest as well. And speaking of electronics, the infotainment is way better than it used to be. And I'm going to talk about that for just a minute. There's a lot of complaints about it looking like it is older like it has been lifted from like the older BMW setup. And the way I'm gonna explain this to you is simple. Now, because I used to work in a tech field, I understand how difficult it is to overshoot your targets with technology. A lot of companies that sell technology solutions will oversell it. They say, look at all the things that we can give you. And the more complicated you make a user interface, the more code it requires, the more potential bugs that you introduce to a setup which means not only do you have to go fix those bugs or most manufacturers don't and the customer's stuck with it. When you overcomplicate it, it means it is just more difficult to keep it running right over the course of its life cycle. So what Mazda really tried to do here was strip it back. And the side effect is it looks pretty basic. There's no fancy colors. There's not insane levels of animations or uh, graphical use. It's just basically a black slab with just the text and information you need. 
and as a side effect, it's simple, and hopefully, over the long term, you're not going to have to be going back and forth to the dealership all the time to have it updated or have freeze-ups with it. All right, following up with that is the fact that they do not have telematics in this car, which means there's no modem, there's no cellular connection to the internet, which means you don't have to support that in the long term and you don't have to worry about that breaking. And for people that are security conscious, that means they're not going to be in the background data logging your driving habits and uploading them to their servers. That's something that many manufacturers are doing now. The other area I glazed over in the review was the LED interior lighting. The gauge cluster uniformity, because you have a digital screen in the middle and analog gauges on the side, it's shocking how good the LCD color and graphics match the physical gauges. And you, if, to the untrained eye, you would never know that the center screen's digital at night unless you really looked at it. The other part they improved was the color uniformity of the interior LED lighting. If you notice cars like Hyundai and Kia, which I complain about a lot, they tend to have this really blue tint and the LED lights don't particularly match in color or hue on the steering wheel, the center area, the, the upper interior lights don't match. Mazda spent the time to color match all of this. So pretty much the entire lighting at night is about 5,000 K and they targeted a CRI value of over 90%. So everything looks even. And that's just, again, it's attention to detail. The other huge pro is sound quality improvements. They've relocated the low frequency drivers to the footwells. They've taken the low frequency speaker out of the door shell and they don't have a hole in there anymore. So it reduces NVH and vibration. So you're lowering the noise floor. They've relocated the mid and the high range drivers. So there are less sound reflections in the car as well. And you notice it immediately when you're driving, uh, driving in pretty much every situation, the sound system is way better. So on to the last few things. The seat design is better than it used to be. It feels more comfortable, less fatiguing, more supportive without being suffocating. Passenger seat's kind of the same way. The adjustability is, is much better on the driver's seat. And even the back seats are a little bit more comfortable. So let's talk about that. Now the back seat space and the hatch, you know, this is exactly how it was in the previous generation Mazda 3. It's not any bigger. It doesn't feel any smaller. The only place you're gonna notice uh, where your headroom is impeded is here on this pillar getting in and out but once you're sitting like a normal person yes it feels like it has a lower roof line there's less glass in here uh, this is not a full-size luxury car so it's going to be tighter feeling that that's what i'm trying to say the seating comfort is good there's a, a ton of padding on the seat it does feel upright but your door armrests are totally squishy like i said in the front it feels like you're putting your arm on a sponge uh, it's something you're going to have to test out and get used to, but I wouldn't find this to be a total con for its price range. All right, the pros of the rear. You have a hatchback option, which is great. They've improved the rear cargo tray, so it kind of comes up more, so you're not as likely to hit your head when you reach in. The previous generation, I cut my head all the time because it was super sharp. This still has a sharper trailing edge, but if you hit it, it's going to move forward more instead of just, you know, cut your head off. I have to reiterate this, this is a car. It's not an SUV. So it's not jacked up on stilts. It doesn't have the hugest cargo capacity, but it's, again, you have to look at this. You have to decide on whether it's gonna be good for you. Let's get into the cons. All right, let's get onto the cons list. The first one, if you choose the trim level with the HUD, the HUD is now displayed or projected onto the windshield. So the module is located in the gauge hood here. So when you're driving over broken or choppy pavement, that projection onto the glass, like your speedometer, you can see shake in it. It has vibration and blurriness, and it's one of the only brands that I've ever seen that has that problem. And it's not just the Mazda 3. So I don't know if it's the way that they mount it inside or the module isn't stabilized enough, but it's annoying. Secondly, you can't permanently turn it off. So you have to go into the driving display mode, disable it there, and every time you restart it, it comes back on. So basically for somebody like me, I want all the features but that, I'm kind of stuck going to a lower trim level to get rid of the HUD because I don't wanna fight with turning it on and off. 
And the reason they do it is because of Mazda's mentality with having driving display information here, here, and infotainment here, and they wanna keep these core functions on at all times, which leads me into the next negative part. With all this technology they're putting in here, they don't allow you to customize it enough. For example, I can only see my volume information here on the infotainment screen. I can't see it on this gauge here in the digital display. I can't see my volume information up here in the heads up display or my Bluetooth information or song change here and here. I can only see it here. So at night, if I wanna turn the display off here, basically your SOL until this screen turns back on or it turns back on when you adjust the volume. It's just really annoying and it's just a, a, a question of logic. What's better, what the customer wants or what Mazda wants. It's a negative to me. The next negative is the Bose audio system. As much as it is so much better than the previous generation, I still find the speakers, the way that they've done the EQ, it's so super flat. Even when you turn on the center point mo mode, which widens the sound stage, it just sounds really dull. Like it lacks brightness. And granted, I'm getting older now, and a lot of the more high-end audio products are brighter because they're geared towards older people that can afford them. I feel like just a tweak in their mid or high range speakers to, to give it some life would be helpful. But again, it's a pro or con depending on who you are. The next negative, which I can understand and I've heard it from people is when you get on the driver's seat and you close these doors, it feels like the visibility is not all that good. Like it's more claustrophobic. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're coming from an older vehicle with a lot of glass, cars from the 90s, early 2000s, or SUVs, this is different. This is a car. It's got a lower roof line. It's got less glass. So when you get in here for the first time, you're going to have to adjust to that. If you need an SUV or this bright cabin, well, this Mazda 3 is probably going to either turn you off or it's going to take getting used to. But in no way does it feel small. It's just kind of an illusion. The next thing is people are going to complain that these vehicles do not have panoramic sunroofs, and I've seen this a lot. All the Mazda models don't. And Mazda claims they don't have a panoramic sunroof because of structural rigidity, because they have to cut a huge hole in the roof to accommodate that. But here's the thing about it. I get it. I get that customers want it, even though that I don't want it. Other manufacturers have figured out a way through the use of structural adhesives, over a hundred feet of them, using different stamping techniques on the inner door shells to increase the cabin rigidity where you can fit a hole in the roof. And Mazda, I don't know that they're there yet, or they don't want to commit to that cost and time to do that just to put a hole there for a panoramic sunroof. But again, it's a con if you're looking for that. Now the next con is kind of a pro as well. Since the telematics, there's no telematic system in here for the infotainment, of course, you can't update it over the air. You are stuck with the maps that are on here. You're stuck with everything that's on here until you take it to a dealership and have it updated. So just so you know. The next con is the way that these silver buttons on the bottom half of these steering wheel controls are. They have cutouts to be backlit at night. And in certain dim light or the cabin is dim, since they're on a downward slope, they're really hard to see in certain lighting conditions in the day. So it's almost like you have to memorize what they are and you're going to see that when you drive more. The next thing you're gonna notice is when you open up these doors and you close them, there's this spring to them. They feel kind of light and cheap. And some of this is just perceived quality. It has nothing to do with the structural integrity of the door. But I feel like if they added a little bit of weight and sound deadening in these doors, they would feel more rigid and it would have a bigger impact on a customer. Now, one of the last cons to talk about is something I've read in the comments incessantly on my videos, including it's coming from the automotive press as well. And that is Mazda's omission of having a turbocharged motor in the new Mazda 3 or a performance trim level. And truthfully, it's a lost opportunity. You have their competitors like Honda with the Civic that has an SI that has a limited slip differential that is cheaper than this car. You have VW with the GTI which again is about the same price as a fully loaded Mazda 3 and the GTI has better performance. Hyundai has the Veloster and the R-Spec, which is cheaper. So, you know, I, I think there's two sides of it, right? For me, I bought a Mazda 3 in the past because I had sports cars. I didn't need my daily driver to be a rocket. 
but most people that are looking for this because this car is so good now people want this one vehicle to be everything they want it to be refined comfortable fuel efficient luxury you know luxury features and they want it to have performance and the mazda 3 at least this is not trying to be a sports car in fact when you drive it you really have to adjust your expectations to realize look this is not going to blow you away in terms of speed and it's not trying to by design so the, the only way i can explain this to you is, is mazda is a smaller company and they are trying their hardest to improve their core products so they have more volume sellers now if you just come out of college and you're saddled with a hundred thousand dollars in student debt and your first job's like 40 grand of course you're not going to have money to piss away or you're not going to have a hundred thousand dollars to piss away on a porsche 911 for a toy you're going to need to get something practical until you can make more money all of that and i feel like that's what mazda is really trying to do with the three and their upcoming changes to their products once they're able to sell 200, 300,000 units a year, if they can even do that with these products, then they're gonna have more money to blow on making that enthusiast product that really is only gonna sell like 15,000 units a year for that small group that needs it. And until they can get to that point, I'm okay with them improving their products. And if you need a sports car or a sporty car, you might have to go elsewhere in the meantime. But I, I'm a big fan of what they're trying to do here. I get the pros and cons. And if you look at it from a more complete picture, you might even appreciate the car more. So that's enough of this. If you haven't checked out my review, please do so. I'll see you next video. Savage geese. <laughs> what a waste of skin. Man, we got to get rid of this guy. I'm going to show you how. But first, let's tune this Subaru. I think 60 PSI should be good. Yeah. Let's do it!